if y equals x to the cosine x, then y prime equals, well, we're gonna do this by logarithmic differentiation. Okay, starting with y equals x to the cosine x, I'm gonna go ahead and take the natural logarithm of each side. So we get ln y equals ln of x to the cosine x using the nice rule for logarithms that says you could take the exponent and bring it out front, we get that this is equal to cosine x times ln x. Now we're going to differentiate each side of this equation. On the left, we'll use implicit differentiation. The derivative of ln y is one over y, and then by the chain rule times dy dx. And on the right, we have a product rule. So the first is cosine x, times the derivative of the second, the derivative of ln x is one over x, plus the second, which is ln of x, times the derivative of cosine x, which is minus sine x. Okay, now I'm just gonna get a common denominator here. Uh, x is in the denominator in the first term, so I'm gonna multiply the second term by x over x. So we have, uh, you could see cosine x over x, and then I had to multiply by x here. I pulled the minus sign out front. So we have minus x times ln x sine x over x. Okay. Now I'm just going to multiply each side of the equation by y to bring the y to the other side of the equation. So we can get dy dx by itself. And then I'm going to replace y by what it's equal to in terms of x. So we get x, cos x to the cosine x times cosine x minus x ln x sine x over x. Let f of x equal negative 3x squared plus x minus 5. Find the value of c that satisfies the conclusion of the mean value theorem for f on the interval negative 2 to 2. Okay, so just a quick Cliff Notes version of the mean value theorem, and then I'll spell it out explicitly. But the, the geometric idea is very simple. It says if you have a sufficiently nice function, meaning no sharp edges, no breaks, no cusps, um, then if you take the secant line between any two points on that curve, so here we have a secant line passing through point A and point B, then between the x-coordinates of those two points, there's a value such that the tangent line to the curve uh, at that x value is parallel to the secant line that you started with. And algebraically, the main point is that you could find a c between a and b such that the derivative at c, this slope, is equal to f of b minus f of a over b minus a, which is the slope of this line. Okay, now spelled out in full, the mean value theorem says that if f is a function that is continuous on the closed interval a, b, and differentiable on the corresponding open interval a, b, that's what I mean by sufficiently nice, then there's a real number c between a and b, such that f prime of c, slope at a tangent line, is equal to the slope of the secant line, f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Okay, but usually, if you know these little cliff notes over here, that's pretty sufficient for answering the questions. Um, we start by taking the derivative of f of x, which is just a power rule. So we get negative 6x, derivative of x is 1, derivative of negative 5 is 0. And um, it says find a value c, so I'm just going to replace the x by a c. Not terribly important. You could always change the x to a c later also. All right, so that's the derivative. And now we need to compute f of b and f of a. So here a is negative 2, b is 2. So f of 2 is, well, we just plug a 2 into the original function, 2 squared there and a 2 there. So we get negative 3 times 4 minus 3, which is negative 12 minus 3 or negative 15. And we're going to do the same for f of negative 2. So I replace x by negative 2. We get negative 3 times the square of negative 2 minus 2 minus 5. The square of negative 2 is 4. And when we combine the negative 2 and the negative 5, we get negative 7. So we have negative 12 minus 7, which is negative 19. All right. So now we're going to be setting f prime of c equal to, here uh, b is 2 and a is negative 2. So f of 2 minus f of negative 2 over 2 minus negative 2. We just computed these values here. So we could substitute in a negative 15 for f of 2, a negative 19 for f of negative 2, and 2 minus minus 2, well, negative negative, that becomes positive, 2 plus 2 is 4. All right, and similarly, uh, this is negative 15 plus 19, which is again 4, and 4 over 4 is 1. 
So we want to set f prime of c equal to 1. Remember that f prime of c is negative 6c plus 1. And we just have to solve this little equation. Subtracting 1 from each side gives us negative 6c equals 0. Dividing by negative 6 gives us that c is equal to 0. Given the function defined by f of x equals 5x cubed minus 3x to the fifth, find all values of x which the graph of f is concave down. Okay, so the second derivative of a function tells us about its concavity. So we're going to have to differentiate this function twice. The first derivative, just using the power rule, bring the 3 down, you get 15x squared. And bring the 5 down, 5 times 3, you get negative 15x to the fourth, knocking one off of the power there. Differentiating again, power rules again, 2 times 15 is 30. Subtract 1 from the exponent, you just get 1, so it's just 30x. And 4 times 15 is 60. Subtract 1 from 4 and you get 3. Okay. So we're going to try and figure out where the second derivative is 0 so we can see where it changes concavity. So first I'm going to factor this expression. So if I factor out a 30x, I'm left with 1. And from here I'm left with 2x squared. And as I said, we want to set that expression equal to 0. So we set each factor equal to 0, 30x equal to 0, and 1 minus 2x squared equal to 0. Uh, 30x equal to 0, if we divide each side by 30, we get x equals 0. And for 1 minus 2x squared equals 0, add 2x squared to each side, then divide by 2, and we get x squared equals a half, or x equals plus or minus 1 root 2. We're using the square root property here. When you have x squared equals something, you get two solutions, plus or minus, right? Uh, and we could, if we want, this actually isn't absolutely necessary, but if we want to rationalize the denominator, this is equal to plus or minus root 2 over 2. Okay, so we use all the values we just found, 0 and plus or minus root 2 over 2, as cutoff points uh, to determine what the concavity is in each of the intervals formed by these three cutoff points. Because these are the three places where the second derivative is zero. They're potential points of inflection. And we want to see if the second derivative is positive or negative in each of the intervals formed by this. So as an example, if we test two back into the second derivative here, this is positive and um, 2 squared is 4 times 2 is 8. 1 minus 8 is negative. So it's a positive times a negative, and the result is negative. We don't actually have to know what the final value is, just whether it's positive or negative. It's negative, and when it's negative, it's, the uh, function is concave down. When the second derivative is negative, the original function is concave down. So uh, some people might ask, why am I drawing two minus signs here? And the only reason for that is so I could finish drawing the face, right? So I like to draw a frowning face for negative. Negative people are sad. Positive people are happy. And that helps me remember that, the, that it's concave down when the second derivative is negative, and it's concave up when the second derivative is positive. Okay, so testing some of these other points, like if we test 0. 0.5, this is positive. And 0.5 squared is, well, that's a half squared, which is a fourth. So two fourths is a half. One minus a half is positive. So that's a positive times a positive, which is positive. Uh, negative 0.5, this um, will still be positive, but this time this will be negative. So the product will be negative. And finally, if we do negative 2, well, before we saw that we got a negative value here, but when it's negative 2, this part will be negative. So the negative times negative will make it positive. Okay. All right, so this shows the concavity in each of these four intervals with these cutoff points. So let's just uh, uh, figure out which ones it's going to be concave down. That's between negative root 2 over 2 and 0, and also after root 2 over 2, right? So for x between negative root 2 over 2 and 0, and for x greater than root 2 over 2. And here's what that looks like in interval notation, right? The open interval from negative root 2 over 2 to 0, together with the open interval from root 2 over 2 to infinity. And that collection is the, that's the set of all uh, x values where the function is concave down. The derivative of g is graphed below. Give a value of x where g has a local minimum. All right, so keep in mind that this graph is of the derivative of g and not of g, right? So the critical numbers are where the derivative is zero. Since this is a graph of the derivative, the uh, critical numbers are at one and six, where this graph hits the x-axis. These are the critical numbers for the original function g because the derivative is zero there. 
okay, one and six. Now, if the derivative is above the x-axis, meaning it's positive, then the original function is increasing. So you could see that before the critical number one and after the critical number six, the function is increasing. And similarly, uh, when the derivative dips below the x-axis, the original function is decreasing. So we see that the original function is decreasing between one and six. So I actually like to draw a little sketch of what the original function might look like, right? It's increasing until we get to one coming up, then it's decreasing between one and six coming down, and then after six, it's gonna be increasing again. And you could actually see exactly where the minimum is now, right? It's right here at the bottom, and that corresponds to x equals six. The function g of x equals 10x to the fourth minus 7e to the x minus 1 for x greater than a half is invertible. The derivative of g inverse at x equals 3 is, all right, well, the formula for the derivative of an inverse is the derivative of the inverse at x is equal to 1 over the derivative of g inverse of x. Notice this is actually a pretty simple formula. Notice all we're doing is that we're interchanging the inverse and the derivative here. And then we're also taking the reciprocal, and that gives us the result. So here, we want to compute the derivative of g inverse at x equals 3. So we're plugging a 3 in here. The trickiest part of this is figuring out, well, what on earth is g inverse of 3, right? Because we have g of x. Don't make the mistake of plugging a 3 in for x and g. We want g inverse of 3 right? We want to know g inverse of 3 is what? That's equivalent to asking g of what is equal to 3 if we're thinking backwards. Sometimes you could solve the equation, right? You could uh, interchange the roles of the dependent and independent variable and solve, but in this case that would be too hard if not impossible. So we just have to kind of wing it and guess and check. There's only one, answer, uh, one value, x value, that makes sense to check because we know that the e is going to go away. So Obviously, it's going to have to be 1, right? Because that's the only thing that's going to make the E go away, right? G of 1 is going to have to be 3. And just to double check, let's plug a 1 in there. 10 times 1 to the 4th minus 7, E to the 1 minus 1. That's 10 minus 7, right? Because E to the 0 is 1, which is, in fact, 3. Okay, so we could go ahead and replace G inverse of 3 by 1, right? Since G of 1 is 3, G inverse of 3 is 1. Okay, so all we have left to do is to figure out what g prime of 1 is. Well, first we have to compute g prime of x, which is a pretty simple derivative. This is a power rule, right? 40x cubed minus 7, the derivative of e to something is e to that thing, times the derivative of x minus 1, but the derivative of x minus 1 is just 1. So there is a little chain rule there, but it doesn't actually add anything. Okay, and now we're going to go ahead and plug in the 1 to get 40 minus 7, which is 33. So the answer is 1 over 33. Gasoline is dripping out of a gas pump, filling up a bucket. The amount of gasoline in the bucket at time t for t between 0 and 4 is given by a differentiable function, capital G, where t is measured in minutes. Selected values of g of t measured in pints are given in the table below. Is there a time t between 1 and 3, at which g prime of t is equal to 2.3. Justify your answer. Okay, this is, once again, a mean value theorem problem. Right, so we're given that g is differentiable, right, between 0 and 4. That implies that g is continuous between 0 and 4, because any point of differentiability is also a point of continuity. The reason I'm mentioning this is because you need continuity on the closed interval, and differentiability on the open interval, but we have it on the closed interval, so our bases are covered, in order to apply the mean value theorem. You need those two things, okay? So uh, g of three minus g of one over three minus one is, well, from the table, g of three is 6.8, g of one is 2.2, and three minus one is two, so that's equal to 2.3, right? Oh, good. So by the mean value theorem, there is at least one time t, between 1 and 3, for which g prime of t is equal to 2.3, right? And actually, that value of t is going to be strictly be between 1 and 3, which is even better than this. And so we have our answer.
The twice differentiable function f is defined for re all real numbers x. Values of f and f prime for various values of x are given in the table below. Explain why there must be a value of c for c between 0 and 3 such that f double prime of c is equal to negative 2. Mean value theorem again. But this time we're going to be applying the mean value theorem to the derivative of f, right? We're given that f is twice differentiable. That means that the second derivative exists, right? So f twice differentiable means that the derivative of f is differentiable. So we're given that the derivative of f is differentiable for all real numbers. In particular, f prime is differentiable on the closed interval 0, 3, which implies once again that, because differentiability implies continuity, that f prime is continuous on the closed interval 0, 3. Those are the conditions we need to apply the mean value theorem. Okay, so we're going to compute f prime of 3 minus f prime of 0 over 3 minus 0, and we're going to use the chart for that. Make sure to use the row labeled f prime instead of accidentally using the row labeled f. Right. So f prime of 3 is negative 8, f prime of 0 is negative 2, negative 8 minus negative 2 is negative 8 plus 2, which is negative 6 over 3 is negative 2. So by the mean value theorem, there's at least one real number c with c between 0 and 3, such that f double prime of c is negative 2, right? It's f double prime because we applied the mean value theorem to f prime. 